You are listening to MCC Votes and Seats, the podcast series of the Center for Political Science of Matthias Corvinus Collegium. We provide election insights with experts and politicians. This time we are going to talk about the background and the process of the March 2024 Portuguese legislative election. It is our pleasure having Mr. Alexander de Souza Carvalho with us, right from the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra. Hi, Alex. It gives us great joy that you accepted our invitation again. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. SNAP legislative election was held on the 10th of March to elect the 230 members of the Assembly of the Republic. No party achieved an absolute majority, with the center-right Democratic Alliance led by Luis Montenegro winning 80 mandates, followed by the Socialist Party, which lost its absolute majority amid recent scandals and controversies. The turnout in the election was at around 60%, the highest since 2005. So, Alex, what factors explain this huge wish to vote expressed by Portuguese citizens. And uh, was the center-right political alliance expected to win? I think there's uh, two two issues that we have to face. The first is that how we have our own political system. We have a, a mixed presidential and a mixed parliamentary system. In October 2021, we had a, a socialist government with, without any absolute majority in parliament. But there was a left-wing uh, majority in parliament if the socialists would like to talk and agree something with the parties to their to its left in october 2021 the national budget put forward by the socialists was rejected in parliament i believe for the first time ever instead of um, forcing a new round of talks to, after the rejection of the, of the budget the president decided to dissolve the assembly the parliament we had a snap election in 2022 where in this case in contrary to what most polls were presenting, we had an absolute majority of the Socialist Party. We assumed then that we had conditions for a stable government for at least four or almost five years. What happened in the meantime? Even though they had a, a majority in parliament, the socialists were very much marred by scandal after scandal. And this is actually what made the, the government with an absolute majority being put into question. In October or November in 2023, after almost two years of uh, a governance which was mostly marred by this type of media Media scandals and uh, resignations from from the cabinets. I think it was fourteen, or maybe twenty months. So fourteen resignations in the cabinet and a governance that was pretty much characterized by not deciding anything. We did not see any significant improvements in governing. We saw the decline, for instance, in social services like health, like education. And then one of the media scandals that happened in I think early November twenty twenty three was called by the Public Prosecution Office the Operation Influencer. It was a, an idea that public officials were either prioritizing or favoring some competitors in terms of public procurement. And there were search parties by the prosecution and the police into the office of the prime minister and into the office of his chief of staff. In the office of his chief of staff was found, I think, 75,000 euros in cash. It was said that uh, the money came from professional dealings he had prior to being chief of staff of uh, things he made in Angola or with Angolan entities that he received in cash. So there was a could be a thing of a tax fraud involved here. And the chief of staff indicated the prime minister as one of his witnesses. This was made public by the police. The public prosecution was forced to say that they were now looking into the prime minister. The prime minister resigned, saying that he's a clear conscience, he has done nothing wrong. He said that he was ashamed uh, that uh, his chief of staff had so much money in his office, but he maintained that his innocence. The discussion at that time uh, was if, uh, did the public prosecution office, which has also been marred by some scandals in terms of making arrests, making cautionary measures uh, last way longer than the, the law permits. The, the question was, was this like a coup d'etat made by the public prosecution office? In Portugal, we kind of have this culture of inquisitory type of uh, dealing with this type of, of scandals. As of a few weeks later, most of the people that were involved in the Operation Influencer have been considered innocent. The courts said that the accusation of the public prosecution did not make any sense. 
what was the best case scenario for Portugal? That the prime minister was corrupt or that the public prosecution made an institutional coup d'etat where they throw down a government with an absolute majority. So this is how we came to the elections in 2024. The former prime minister resigned. He said he was leaving a public life or political life. So we had a new leader from the socialists called Pedro Nunes Santos, which is kind of a more leftist inside the, the, the socialists party. Our own political parties and the political center are the socialists and the social democrats. Both these parties are kind of far away from what we traditionally consider socialism or social democracy in political science. Uh, in spite of their names, these are centrists, one more center-left, the other more center-right. So, as I was saying, we had a new leader by, for the socialists and a somewhat newish leader for the social democrats. And what was so momentous in this election is, again, the center does not have a clear majority. So, the social democrats, even in coalition with the Christian Democrats and the monarchists, and even, even if you can consider, although they didn't go in coalition, but they have a natural talking partner with the liberals, the right-wing liberals. If you want these right-wing democratic political parties uh, achieve 88 political uh, representatives in parliament, you need at least 116 to have a majority in parliament. What happened is that for the first time, we have a third political party with a huge representation that we did not have, I think, ever, okay? This happens to be the extreme or far-right or radical right party, or whatever you want to call it, uh, Shega. They gain 50 seats. So we kind of have a scenario of uh, squaring the circle. So how do we have a stable government that does not include a radical or extreme right political party? Just going a wee bit back to the scandalous yeah. issues, just to uh, finish that story. Was it really a, a coup d'etat by the prosecution office, as you mentioned? And uh, do you think uh, democratic institutions have been shaken by what happened? And did it directly and unquestioningly led to the victory of the center-right democratic alliance? Famously, in Portugal, justice comes very slowly. There are major scandals thrown in the news even before the accused are aware. And before the police arrives on the location, the journalists are already there. So there are leaks between uh, the justice system and the media. It's also very common that we talk about these scandals for years, it becomes a, a, something that is very big, very hyped, very uh, emotional. And then the results from the investigations or the results from the courts are very low or small in comparison. The Operation Influencer, so back to November 2023, it seems very thin. The connections between government at the national level and government at the local level and private entities, it really doesn't look like the prime minister had anything to do with this. I think it was a wrong move for us to have a snap election. But this wasn't like 2021 or 22, where the president dissolved parliament. This was a case of a search warrant by the public prosecution. And from that first day, there was a, a public statement or a press statement by the public prosecution saying they were now looking into the prime minister. And that was the last sentence or the last paragraph of, the, of that press declaration. And that motivated the prime minister to present his own resignation. So this was not a case of the president dissolving parliament. In this sense, could it be a conspiracy between the justice system and the media against the socialists then? I cannot say that, with, obviously, with that, anything but a gut feeling. There are many signs that uh, either the public prosecution doesn't have the necessary means to conclude its own investigations and accusations in the proper timing. Uh, also, it doesn't help that uh, there are many cases where the media is present at the locations before the searches take place. And that obviously suggests there are leaks inside the justice system or in the public prosecution to the media. The case against the prime minister, which motivated his resignation, is wafer thin. The prime minister could have taken this opportunity to just remove himself from the picture. So there was, um, there was also talk for quite a few years that uh, the prime minister, Antonio Costa, 
was kind of saturated or tired of being in public life. Also, the pandemic was uh, mm. very difficult, obviously. And he has been in power since 2015. He was That's kind of looking time. for an opportunity to, to resign. Yes, th there was there was talk that he was might be looking for a way out. Okay. For instance, to go into European politics, for instance, at European Union level or some international organization level. Um, at least so far, that did not happen. Or it could just be, this is very speculative, but playing a long game, that he was removed from office unjustly, so he can maybe come back at a later stage with a different aura, with his image renewed, where people might linger for him. Some people suspect that he could also maybe run for president in the future or in the near future, maybe. Or maybe he was just seeing that his government was in at the dead end and he didn't want to um, harm his image in any other way or for more time. We are talking about tactics and, and strategy. You already mentioned the emergence of the third political force, Chega. Yeah. Most mainstream international media intention was focusing on the Chega party. That became the yeah. third largest political formation in parliament, gaining 50 seats, as, as you mentioned. What yeah. is the key to success of Andre Ventura's uh, right-wing populist party? Well, the first thing you have to understand uh, with Chega, it's, it's pretty much a one-man show. There are obvious similarities with Trump with Bolsonaro in Brazil, with Santiago Abascal in Spain or Fratelli d'Italia. But it's pretty much a one-man show. This is a man who appeared first as a footballer commentator. Had he made his training, this political training, as a, a soccer or football commentator in very sensationalist environment. He's very well accustomed to making scenes in parliament. But the reason for his success is twofold. Once, he's pretty much copying the textbook of Trump, of Bolsonaro, or Santiago Abascal. You can't really put a pin comparison with Trump because Trump is not a one-man show. Or in terms of American politics, it's a two-party two system. So even figure like Trump appears, there are also senators in the Republican Party which have some gravitas, some authority within the party. Either way that they choose to be aligned. This was not the case with Ventura in Chega. Ventura left the Social Democrats in 2017, in 2018, sorry, and started forming his own coalition made mostly out of religious fundamentalists, some former Social Democrats, some former Christian Democrats and some groups within the extreme far right. The success of Ventura is showmanship, taking the same narratives that Trump and Bolsonaro did, or Orban as well, with the things like gender ideology, and uh, that the world is taken over by the globalists and the socialists. And so he took advantage of those narratives which were being put forward in the United States, in Brazil, in Spain, uh, also against, obviously, his narrative against immigrants, and in particular in Portugal against the gypsy community. As any populist leader, he will take uh, narratives that are uh, gaining traction and use them to his own advantage. The second one, which I think is also similar to different populist leaders across the world, is that politics as usual has, for a long time now, been negating the needs of everyday people. There's the terrorism crisis. There's the financial crisis. There's the food security crisis. There's the refugee crisis. There's the pandemic crisis. There's the social security crisis. What we've been witnessing is this, this idea of the crisis as the permanent reality. The state of exception as a permanent reality. The state of exception is the governance status quo. If you are constantly responding to new crises without resolving the previous ones, problems start to accumulate. They never get resolved. On the contrary, they get worse. Aside from the de deterioration of public services, the attacks on the middle class, not necessarily attacks on the middle class, but not responding to the needs of the middle class, especially after a pandemic. If you see the public services deteriorating, if you see the issues that affect your lives are not being resolved, and you see, if you're in the middle class, a compression of your own salaries or the purchasing power or ability to live, 75% of the population in Portugal has trouble paying their own bills. And you have a political party that's saying this is fault of the political center, mostly the socialists, because they have been in power the for the most time. 
This is a problem of this political center, and we need to change it. And part of the platform of the Chega, like many populist parties, is to arrange a scapegoat. In many cases, immigrants are in, in many of our cases, the gypsy community, the very poor are exploiting the system. And then there's an elite, uh, the intellectual or the political or the, some economic elite that is taking advantage of the system as well and, the, and is corrupted. And this, in a scenario, again, when 75% of the population has trouble paying their own bills, or living month to month on their wages, that partly explains its success. This is a momentous change in Portuguese politics. Never a third party in Portugal gained more than 30 seats and Chega gained 50. And the last one to gain 30 seats was the communists in 1976, just after the revolution, while we were transitioning to a democratic system. For the most part, we had two main political parties at the center. I think the best case scenario, aside from that, was in 2015, the parties to the left of the socialists, which actually formed what we call the contraption or the geringosa, which helped the socialists govern from 2015 to 2019. The left bloc and the communist party together had between 30 and 40 uh, MPs, but they were together to have a single political party or a third party with this much power, which can disrupt parliamentary politics. That is quite new. This is why it might be an instance of squaring the circle, as I was saying before. You cannot have the center right by itself governing because they don't have a majority. You cannot have the center right and the center left governing together because then you empower the third political party, the radical right. If we can't have the center right governing with the extreme right, and we can't have the center right governing with the center left, there might be a good chance that um, we are heading into another uh, snap election in maybe two years' time. The extreme or far right party gets a chance to say to to govern, which is also something that we don't have a history of in democracy. Can we interpret this election as a clash between the old establishment parties and the newcomers, the anti-establishment formations? Probably not, because the liberals or the libertarians, they are both new parties. They both had good results, but the liberals did not capitalize on political representation as much as they probably were expected to. They elected eight MPs. At the polls, they were talking about 12 or 13 or 14 MPs. We are witnessing a rec recomposition of the political right in Portugal because Chega, Chega is not something new. There have been numerous attempts in the past to federate uh, the extreme right. After the revolution in 74, the extreme right has pretty much always been dispersed in numerous very small groups. Chega is, for the first time, I think, successfully federating them and putting them in the same umbrella. Not everyone, but most of them. So in that sense, Chega is not something new. Its success is. The Party Livre, it's pretty much a European center-left party, so it's very similar to the Socialist Party with a more green agenda. They elected four MPs, which is the best they had so far, while Left Bloc uh, elected five and the Communists elected four as well. I think this is a case where the political parties to the left of the Socialists, especially Left Bloc and the Communists, are still being punished. I think Left Bloc and the, the Communist Party are somewhat still being punished by rejecting the national budget in 2021, which called for the snap elections. And the Communist Party, I believe, is also being punished as well for its own political stance on the Ukraine situation. It's the position that the media portrayed that the Communist Party has. Those parties, which in 2015, they had 30-something, almost 40 MPs, they are now reduced to nine MPs between the two of them. But Chega appeared in 2019. They elected one in 2019. They elected 12 in 2022. And now they elected 50 in 2024. It's a very quick and very large growth. This has not happened with Livre. This has not happened with the liberals. The center political parties especially the Social Democrats. They have not been in power for quite some time. The Social Democrats, in this election, they were in coalition with the Christian Democrats and the Monarchists, which is a very small party. But even in percentage-wise, they have not reached 
30%. Mm-hmm. And this has been quite a trend in the last few years. They now achieve 28%. In 2022, they had 27%. And in 2015, which was the last time they, they actually won an election, they had 37%. But again, they were a coalition between the Social Democrats and the, and the Christian Democrats. But even though they won, they did not have a majority because the rest of the political parties which were elected were mostly on the left. So the left had a parliamentary majority the right did not. For the most time since 2015, even though Social Democrats have won the election now, they are still within the 20-30% or in 25-30% range. This is not Spain. Like uh, a few years ago, Spain had like Pepe and uh, Soy, so the uh, Popular yeah, Party yeah. and the Socialists had almost like identical 25%. And then Ciudadanos and Podemos were around 20 to 25% as well. So like a, a four-way uh, political party or four-political party system. This is not yet the case. It could be argued, though, that our own political system, even though we have a multi-party system, if there's another snap election and the results are somewhat the same, then we can talk about that our system is not revolving anymore around two political parties, but revolving around three. Because there's this chance that Chega might want to surpass the Social Democrats or eat away their, their electorate and possibly heading into government to, to be to be the most voted party. For now, uh, the Socialist Party has, I think, 27, 28% as well this this election. If the Socialist Party does not grow in the future, then we can maybe look at the scenario that the, our political system might be revolving now around three political parties. Yeah, and it's quite natural, isn't it? Because the electorate itself is constantly changing everywhere. And uh, their preferences, because, yeah, you know, we could read articles like the the sympathizers of Ventura's Sega party are mostly young people because his team is full of young influencers. And, um, you know, but everywhere in the world, young voters and first time voters tend to vote for anti-establishment parties and so on and so forth. Actually, thank you for mentioning it. There was a poll or quite a few polls, actually, uh, that came out like one or two months ago prior to the election. The, the young voters between 18 to 30, 34 years old were mostly on the right wing. Mm-hmm. So they were either with Chega or with the liberals. And that in part has to do, I think, there are somewhat new parties. They can gain the momentum more easily with the younger voters. They also tend to work a little bit better on social media, especially Chega which has been working TikTok like no other political party is working in Portugal. So, But it's also because those young kids or these young voters, they've only witnessed the socialists in government. We have uh, electoral circles of Europe and outside of Europe. So people who are not res- currently residing in Portugal... Uh, but they can they, they also get uh, a vote. Mm-hmm. There are four seats available, two for the European circle and two for the rest of the world circle. Chega elected two out of these four. So this is something that we also did not see. For the most part, I think the Social Democrats won those circles, but Chega won, curiously enough, in Switzerland and in Luxembourg, countries where there are actually a strong Portuguese community for quite a while. The voters, I would assume, to be more older. And they also won, I think, in Brazil or in some parts of Brazil. Yeah, it's quite interesting also that within Portugal, Chega won in the southernmost electoral district, which used to be a former socialist stronghold. The Algarve, which uh, Chega won, is mostly a tourist destination. Numerous uh, government officials from either the socialists or the social democrats saying that tourism is our own way out. This, uh, this is our strategy to uh, grow in Europe. And what we witness, especially in the Algarve, is the touristification of the society. So we have a very young population. There are there are many youngsters in, in the Algarve, or people uh, with 35 years or younger, but they don't have jobs. Unemployment tends to be one of the highest in the country in the Algarve. When there is employment, it's mostly related to tourism, and it is very badly paid. It's insecure employment. It's lack of uh, social protection. So if you have a situation where people don't have public services, are badly paid, and we have a housing crisis, 
populist message can get through, that the center is not resolving the issues that most affect our lives. In our podcast, we addressed many interesting issues like uh, society problems, the uh, rise of, of the Shega party, and the. but we did not really talk about the center-right democratic alliance that narrowly won the election and uh, yeah. is, is likely to form a government or, or I don't yeah. know. What were their messages in the campaign and which political formations are likely to form a coalition with them? The center-right pretty much had only one agenda on their platform, which was, it's time to change. It's pretty much attacking the socialists because they have been in government for so long. People just being fed up with the socialists, the numerous scandals, the numerous resignations. Some of the most uh, meditized messages they put across was that um, they should reverse the abortion law. So they, they should maybe illegalize, prohibit abortion again, uh, that there may be a need for armed militias to avoid uh, or to confront uh, immigrants, especially in rural and agricultural scenarios, and the de denial of climate change. These are political opinions expressed during the campaign from numerous uh, political uh, representatives of the coalition in, in different districts. Yet they ruled out any coalition with uh, the right-wing populist Shega. Yes, so far. <laughs> This is why we have a squaring the circle problem. Let's play this out. Imagine we are the center-right coalition. Uh, we have amongst us 80 MPs. We can talk to the liberals. Uh, we have 88 MPs, which can be aligned in parliament. You still need 28 MPs to get a majority in parliament, to get anything through parliament. What are your chances? You can either talk to Chega or some of the people at Chega, where we also already promised that we wouldn't Or we can talk to the socialists who we have been saying that it's time for them to go out. So, so either ways, you have to go against what you have been saying throughout yeah. the campaign. Yeah, and this is actually one of the criticisms that the Social Democrats commentators have been pointing out. The socialists can't have it both ways. They can't have a, a discourse that we need to form like a, a wall between democratic parties and non-democratic parties, so leaving Chega out, and then refusing to engage with the Social Democrats, because the socialists already said they accepted the defeat and there will be opposition. It's the prudent thing to do tactically, because if you have the both center parties in government, you're only going to embolden uh, Chega. So you need to create uh, some form, even if it's an illusion, it was an illusion of an alternative, of a democratic alternative. But as I was saying, social Democrats commentators have been saying to the socialists, you can't have it both ways. You can't expect us to say no to Chega, to not talk to Chega, to not govern with Chega, and then refuse to engage with us. Because this only creates a very small majority in parliament where the liberals and the Christian Democrats and the, and the social Democrats have 88 uh, MPs. The entire left has maybe, what, 90, 90-something MPs? So it's still a long way out of a, of a majority. There is no stable way to govern. Maybe the fact that the socialists lost this election by such a small margin might have been a blessing in disguise for the socialists, because they can argue that their defeat was very small, but they now can put in the, the cloak of the opposition, renew their image from people who have been uh, fed up of, of them being in power for eight, nine years. So it's a, it's a tough question. Squaring the circle in Portugal, I guess. Alexandre de Souza Carvalho from the University of Coimbra, thank you very much for being our guide to the recent early Portuguese parliamentary election. Taking a look at the election results, it seems to me we will continue our uh, analysis very soon. But until then, we wish you all good luck for your future endeavors. It was a pleasure talking with you. You too, Balin. Take care.